This week on CrossFeed. Pop star priest packs them in. New York Times CEO holds the truth. Focus on the family, changing their tone. Polygamous growing. And the Episcopalians, as usual, are still fighting. Hello, everybody. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, and it is November 18th when we were recording this. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, and the only reason it's not a November 11th uh, episode is the sound really screwed up. But we had just a fantastic episode. It was, I think it was like best, best ever. Best <laughs> <laughs> by far. You know, but oh well, that's the life. It's what happens and stuff. But this is the Thursday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I hope you all are looking forward to a good Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, we're very excited. We're going to our um, daughter-in-law's parents' house. She's she's having us there, and and you're going to have all six of your daughters there for Thanksgiving. Yep, yep. We'll uh, have a house full, even though it's just us. So. so. Yeah, I was uh, thinking about you this week because I noticed one of the things they're talking about in order to close the budget deficit is reducing the child tax tax credit. And I'm like, man, that won't do Dale any favors. No, no, it won't. You know, I I don't mind um, tightening the belt if they're actually going to, you know, actually going to reduce the deficit and not just, you know, throw it at some lobbyist or something like that instead. So... Um, they'll throw it at somebody. Remind me to. I, I'll have. I'll have to send you a uh, a link, uh, and, and, that, and you'll see your tax dollars at work and, and what wonderful <laughs> stuff you get. From them. I don't want to see that. I'd rather see them throw it at hostess so that we can get more Twinkies back. <laughs> hey, they, they they were headquartered in Kansas City. Twinkies used to be. They moved to Texas, so why we're alive at stuff. But hey, as long as we're talking politics, let's talk focus on the family here. Okay. This is a really cool story. I was excited about this. I was too. I just um <clears throat> now it's not too well known that uh, James Dobson, who founded Focus on the Family, pretty much stepped away from it a few years ago. Actually didn't know that. <laughs> or uh, I, I think I knew but I forgot, you know. Yeah, he still does some stuff with it, but I mean, in day to day running the the, the, the whole organization, he's pretty much stepped away. And um, so, um, this new president, his name's Jim Bailey, and this was written in in the wake of uh, the uh, uh, last election, which didn't exactly go the way they wanted to. Um, they're just, you know, he 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 really is kind of rethinking this whole thing uh, and the way that they've been acting. Um, you know, first off, he says, um, you know, when it comes to some of the issues that are important to conservative Christians, for example, same-sex marriage, um, they're, they're, overall, he thinks Christians are on the losing side of a cultural paradigm. Um, uh, you know, uh, but more importantly, I think he said, is that – yeah, and this is, you know, I think it's absolutely right. Evangelicals have made a mistake by marching in lockstep with the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. If the Christian message has been too wrapped around the axle of the Republican Party, then A, that's our fault, and B, we need to rethink that. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is this is what we've been, we've talked about on the show. Yep. Um, that uh, you know, both parties have their points. Um, both of them are made up of sinners. Both of them are human institutions and are therefore inherently flawed. But it, it, it's more important than that. It's when your church becomes identified or your, your, your group becomes identified with a particular party. It's if that's when you're saying it's God party because, you know, <laughs> politicians use you. I mean, that's, that's all it comes down to. I hate to say that. I used to have a, you know, people wonder... Are, are worried about, uh, you know, campaign finance and, you know, money going to different people. My opinion of, of, of them can only be described by one politician I once read who said, if I can't take your money, eat your, um, eat, eat your food, and kiss your women, and turn around and vote against you, 
I don't call it, it's deserve to be called a politician. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's my view of them. I remember back when I was in seminary and, um, they, uh, uh, we were all encouraged to vote for, uh, Dick Gephardt for congressman because he was pro-life. He was also kind of Looney Tunes on the left in terms of, uh, being the Democrat. But then when, uh, so, you know, but he, he, he had this good pro-life line. And then when he when, – when uh, a Supreme Court case came through and now – which signaled that they would be allowing restrictions on abortions, he suddenly turned around and became pro-choice. Hmm. Well, the fact was he was pro-choice this whole thing. But as long as he knew he did never have to vote on it, he would milk the vote for what it was worth. Right. I mean it, it was a long, hard, careful thought in like you know, about two days uh, that he made his change and stuff. Uh, that's just the that's just the way it is. I mean, the Republican Party will will take the right wing conservative vote, Christian or evangelical vote, but if it's to their advantage to go against it, they will. Right. Yeah, and you know what it comes down to is that um, when when we as church or as as, um, as Christians uh, say that, well, you know, this is the Christian Party or, or something like that. You know, what are we what are we saying? We're saying that if your politics don't line up, um, if you think that there are better ways to um, to do whatever it is that the government's trying to accomplish, uh, then and then what the Republican Party has proposed, then you can't be a Christian. Right. You know, and that, well, that's something that's you know, historically, the Christianity is one of the few organizations that doesn't hold to a particular uh, political uh, slant. Right. Or at least it shouldn't. Um, well, right. Yeah. I like what he said. He says, we've got to, what we've got to do in the Christian community is be far more humble, be winsome. You know, I mean, it, it is, um, you know, which is, you know, the last thing you'd ever hear about, you know, James Dobson, they didn't think he was particularly winsome, uh, and his citizen link is, you know, extremely conservative. But the, the reality is, is the, the Republican Party would dump the values voters in a second uh, if they, if you know, if it caught. If it, if, matter of fact, there've been a lot of, uh, you know, rep, uh, establishment Republicans saying, "Hey, you know, we need to drop this whole social conservative side of things. It's just getting in the way." Um, on the. Uh, 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 where this Jim Daly is um, kind of reaching a lot of disagreement is in the area of gay marriage. Uh, he says um, that uh, uh, basically um, Christianity is on the wrong side of demographics there. That uh, the millennials have a lot less issues with, 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 with homosexuality. Um, and now that uh, homosexuality, uh, uh, homosexual marriage was approved in Maryland, Maine, and Washington, and a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage was uh, defeated in Minnesota, although the law still – the laws of Minnesota still forbid same-sex marriage. Um, that, that needs to be pointed out. Um, and that changed because uh, up to that point, there had been a, every vote – every state that had voted on the issue of same-sex marriage had been defeated. Um, and there is an issue then of how accurate is that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean you talk – I mean look at Maryland, Maine, and Washington. We're talking three of the – you know, bluest of blue states. Right. Uh, you really are uh, in, in all of those. And Minnesota is also a very blue state. Uh, you're not talking – I mean it would be different if this was Missouri, Oklahoma. I mean it's well, not Texas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, well, and that would be huge, but, you know, even a swing state like Ohio – you know, I mean, that's, there's a huge difference between Ohio 
and, you know, those sort of coastal uh, blue states. Now, what happened in Iowa? Because I remember the last of the judges, Supreme Court justice, side supported same-sex marriage was up for re-election, and he had uh, all the others tossed out. I don't think it held. I Boy, I, I'd have to go back. I, I haven't really thought about it. Okay, that's uh, just dawned on me. Yeah, what they did. So, you know, but anyway, at the same time, while he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, this this is an, an issue that we're going to need to really look at and, and how we're going to deal with this and deal with it winsomely in the, the long haul. He also says, you know, we need to find common ground with people that we disagree with. Uh, people who are pro-choice, can we uh, find common ground on, on adoption? Um, uh, he trying to build a working shape of the Obama administration to, to combat fatherlessness. Um, you know, I mean, he said, you know, where can we build maybe some, some relationships in these things, which makes perfect sense to me. Right. Yeah. Where can we find common ground? And, you know, we're not going to agree on everything. And, and certainly we're not going to, um, we're, we're still going to say what we believe. Um, but at the same time, if there's things that where we do agree with each other, it makes sense to work together on those things. Um, and I really like it that the, the last part is after, frankly, after the election, I felt sorry for President Obama in one respect. He's got a tough job. We need to pray for him as the Christian community. I mean, I think the President Obama needs divine guidance. He stressed this does not mean in a condescending or sarcastic way. Um, and that's, you know, absolutely he, right. I mean, yeah, I wonder how many Christians, you know, look, take a look at Paul's words and it says, you know, that he wants us to pray for kings, rulers, and all in authority. Mm-hmm. And the kings and rulers were, for him, the pagans. They weren't even Christian to begin with, in, in any way, shape, or form. Well, you know, he, he talks about, he, he talks about obeying the rulers when he's writing from prison, where he's imprisoned by the government to, um, you know, for being a Christian. Oh, well, he sets that in Romans, but he wasn't imprisoned yet. No, there was an, I had, there was another one where it talked about submitting to authority. I'd have to check. It must be in Colossians or Ephesians, because it's not in Philippians or Philemon. Oh, I, I remember seeing that at some point, and I went, "Whoa, wait a minute!" He was writing from prison here. Yeah, so I'd have to look it up. It's a, it's you know, I mean, and obviously we've said that, you know, we, you know, I've said, you know, we need to pray for our president regularly. Um, but we were just talking this morning about um, the drought in the Midwest, and uh, that I was reading yesterday that uh, they're talking about lowering the Mississippi River because uh, letting less water from the Missouri go into it. Well, if that happens, the Mississippi is going to be so low they can't let barges up it any longer. Hmm. And you think we've got an economic pinch now? That that would put a stranglehold on the country. That would really hurt. Yeah. So much coal, oil, and all kinds of things moves up and down the Mississippi. Yep. Um, and that's beyond the president's ability to deal with. Mm-hmm. And right. I'm sure everybody thinks he's got so much power. I'm sure if they're sitting in that office, I'm sure he's thinking like, man, I can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a tough job. And, and I certainly, there's there's lots of things I disagree with him on. There's things I agree with him on, you know, um. But at the same time, uh, he's not a dictator. He's not a, um, uh, you know, a, a monarch of any, you know, he's, he's a president. He's one of the three branches of government. Yeah. Some, some of our, our, some people you and I know would disagree that he thinks about him being a monarch. At least does that he thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, okay. So he, this guy's saying we need to kind of, you know, try to build relationships and be real with them on our whole area, gay marriage. But what about polygamy? You know, it's funny because, you know, we've talked about this. Yep. Um, we've, we've talked about that. Um, when, when we talk about gay marriage, a lot of times we say, look, you know, if you are going to allow gay marriage because you're going to allow marriage to be defined however people want, then, um, what's to stop you from allowing polygamy? So, um, this is a blog from the Washington Post. And, uh, and it's basically saying, look, what's to stop polygamy from happening? Um, and, and really, I, I think that 
that's next. As soon as, as soon as gay marriage is in more than, um, you know, in, in 25, 26 states, probably even before that, you're going to start seeing a huge push for polygamy. Um, and, and this article talks about what are the problems with polygamy? You know, we, we have such a, a push for freedom and people, you know, whatever they want to do, they should have the right to do. And, um, but there's some pretty serious problems with it. But it, before we get into those, it struck me as interesting that who are the groups that are really pushing for polygamy? The, the sort of large organized groups, right? The Muslims and the, um, the fundamentalist, uh, Latter day Saints. Yeah. Th- yeah. Well, we're both although, very conservative. The, the fundament- so called fundamentalist Mormons are, the Mormons would say they're not really Mormons because right. Mormon isn't banded, but they think, you know. But that's have, their name, though. They're the FLDS. Yeah. But, but let's, let's just, yeah. The, the, well, I, I think they'd probably be happier. The Mormons probably happier if we called them fundamentalist Mormons instead of fundamentalist LDS because they would say they are. But anyway, yeah, which is, which is, which is an interest, which is interesting, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, and this guy in the, this this blog post is arguing against um, polygamy. Mm-hmm. He's saying, unlike um, you know, homosexual marriage and some other things, uh, because there there was there was you know some forms of homosexual marriage in the Roman Empire. Nero married someone in a in a cer- quote ceremony one time. Um, you know, he, he you know he points out that you know polygamy has always been banned in Western history, pre-Christian and post-Christian. Uh, pagan Roman emperors made polygamy an infamous crime in 258. Uh, Enlightenment liberals disestablished Christianity, but still regarded polygamy as a betrayal of nature, utility, and fairness. Um, <laughs> the funny part is, <laughs> you know, one of the. Uh, uh, People in the in the comments said, "So, do I re- perceive a pro Western bias against polygamy? You know, is this just a, a Western thing? You know, so there, right there, there is that relativism. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether mm-hmm. you know, not asking, you know, what does God say, but you know, you know, what find what do people find fulfilling? Of course, part of his issue that I've got with his article is, okay, yes, you're absolutely right. The West had a prohibition on polygamy." But on the other hand, um, there was a functional polygamy going on. Yes, you may not actually have married more than one wife, but you know, going to the temples to, in, in, in uh, the, within the Roman Empire, going to the temples for prostitution was considered perfectly uh, under perfectly fine um, in quote Western quote uh, Europe. The um, the monarchs often had um, mistresses. Oh right, yeah. I mean, you know, you married for reasons of state, but you had the mistress on the side. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you know, there was a functional polygamy. Well, you know, in in the United States, we already have serial polygamy. Yeah, um, yes, call that divorce. <laughs> He's. Yeah, you just, you just get divorced in between, you know. Although some people don't even do that. Well, right. They just live with different people. Right. Yeah, you just you know, people just bump from one to the next, and so you know, at that point, then you just blur the line a little bit, and you just don't leave the one before you start living with the next one. So, but he makes the argument that really, you know, this is not especially to women's advantage. Um, that, you know, this, this goes back to, and Jesus wasn't talking about polygamy when he said it, but, um, but he was absolutely right, of course, um, when he said no servant can serve two masters, right? Either, uh, he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other, you know? And, and so he was talking about, he said, you can't serve God and mammon or, um, money, material possessions. Okay. But the statement is true when applied to other things too including marriage. And we see that, um, you look at the, you know, the patriarchs, you look at the, um, uh, you look at, um, you know, Jacob and, and his wives and concubines, you know, 
and uh you know you see this this competition between um Rachel and Leah and uh yeah he he it's kind of funny you know, what he talks in here about um uh oh gosh i i just the how it harms women i oh um once pushed aside for a rival co-wife, women are reduced to rival slaves within the household. They are then exploited periodically for sex and procreation by emotionally detached husbands. Um, I'm like, boy, is that, is that a description of Jacob and his family right there? I know, I know, totally. I, mean, I was like, this is an absolutely perfect description, you know. And, um, um, I mean, you know, like we, we just covered the, 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 their story in uh, confirmation uh and you know, and you know, we just we, I said, guys, what do you think this family was like? Would you like to live in this group? And they're like, no. I said, yeah. Didn't these people kind of put you know the dis into the dysfunctional? You know, <laughs> <laughs> they're all like, yeah, man, no, they, they, oh, he's weird, you know. Yeah. So, you know, but that's the problem is that it's it's impossible to be fully devoted to two different people and um you know so you're you're always going to end up with this competition and you can say no 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 we're you know we all get along well and and all that kind of stuff yeah right (laughs) for so long all right um but still there's always going to be a a certain degree of competition and um so, but he also mentions that the harm, not just that it causes to women by, um, by putting the stress on them and, and saying, well, you know, as, as soon as, uh, as soon as she's not, you know, her looks go or, you know, there's co- all of that competition to, to try to remain in favor and, and things. Um, you know, he talks about children, um, where you have rivalry with different, uh, mothers and, um, you know, and then it says, men, are har- men too are harmed by polygamy, promotes marriage by the richest, not necessarily the fittest men in body, mind, or virtue. In isolated communities, polygamy often leads to ostracism of rival younger men. Polygamy inflames a man's lust, for once he adds a second wife, he will inevitably desire more, even the wife of another. And polygamy deprives men of that essential organic bond of exclusive marital companionship, which ancients and moderns alike say is critical to most men's physical, psychological, moral, and even spiritual health. So, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting just the language that he's using here, because I, I can see a lot of people just sort of, um, more those who are more socially liberal seeing this and going, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, it's true that you run into this and, and really, if you, if you think about, um, that overall, uh, in this world, there's actually quite a few less women than there are men. Um, you know, where I can see them instituting polygamy, be like in China, except for multiple husbands with the same wife, <laughs> because they have so many more men than women. Uh, Japan also has problems with that. Uh, India has problems with that. Um, you know, so I'm not saying that that's the answer, but what it comes down to is generally where you have polygamy, um, and, and this is more often than not, um, it is one man and multiple women, not the other way around. Oh yeah. Yeah, Because the the guy is somebody that talked about polyandry and, 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 and well, the, well, the, the reality is that's, that does not happen that 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 often. I mean, there's really one woman and multiple men. It's generally always one man, multiple women, and you can go all, all over um, the the world about that. Um, yeah, but Jim, you've talked about uh, these sort of uh, you know this is this is kind of just the beginning um, because. What about when you have uh, two men and three women? You know, wh- where do you draw the line? Pretty soon you, you've got a whole commune and they're all married to each other, you know? Right. There's, there's nothing stopping it. I mean, you know, the, the guy quotes that he, he uh, 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 you know, what uh, 
uh, Antonin Scalia wrote in Lawrence versus Texas. He said, you know, state laws against bigamy, same-sex marriage, adult incest, prostitution, bestiality, obscenity are now all called into question. And that's true. Because once you say something about, you know, it, it's all based on love and it's all based on a mutually consensual relationship, everything else goes out the window. Right. Yeah. You know, at that point, what's wrong with incest as long as you take precautions against um, against uh, childbirth? Right. I mean, you know. And, and even at that point, yeah, you know, whatever, you just have abortions, <laughs> you know? Yep. I mean, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a, you know. Yes, you think. You know, you know what the problem is in this? It really comes down to a moral relativism. You know, and there's your truth and my truth and both of them are equally good. As opposed to Christianity, which is based really not on a moral – on a relative truth but on an objective truth. And that's not my thinking of that. That's the CEO of the New York Times. <laughs> This is kind of striking considering New York Times, uh, you know, we talk about liberal and conservative um, and, and Christians. And, you know, New York Times is not known for its conservative um, bias. And we've pointed that out several times with various uh, New York Times articles that we've looked at through the years. I thought it was right up there with National Review. <laughs> so um, so here we have the uh, new president and CEO of the New York Times, Mark Thompson. He is a practicing Catholic who believes, quote, that truths of the Christian faith are objective truths rather than being entirely subjective. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Did they know this about him? <laughs> you know, I have no idea. Um, you know, yeah, that's, it's an absolutely wild thing. Um, and his belief is that secularism is in decline on a worldwide uh, uh, scale. Now, one guy got really upset about that in, in the comments in it. But, um, you know, probably actually in a worldwide scale, you might, you could, you could possibly make that argument. In the West, West, no. Mm -hmm. But, um, on the southern half of the hemisphere, especially in Africa and in much of Asia, you know, Christianity is on the growth. Yeah. And the idea of, of secularism, that there's nothing out there. Um, it, it, you could, yeah, it is, it is going down. Yeah, yeah the the um, the atheist uh, percentage in Africa is like zero. I mean, like I'm sure there's a few out there, <laughs> but I mean, you just well, <laughs> we talked about that last week, but <laughs> y'all didn't get to see that one. <laughs> no, uh -uh. yeah, you missed some very insightful commentary. <laughs> Oh man, the whole! I, I'm really sad that we lost the rape by demon story. <laughs> I, I am too. Well, we'll, we'll do that one again, folks. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll bring that story back. I I didn't want to do it two weeks in a row, but um, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll bring that story back. That's kind of an interesting. That was a, kind of a weird story. Um, I, I, and I just thought this one was really interesting. Um, one of the mistakes secularists. Of the secularist is not to understand the character of what blasphemy feels to someone who is a realist in their religious belief. For a Muslim, a comic or demeaning depiction of the Prophet Muhammad might have the force be the emotional force of a piece of grotesque child pornography. Religion as it is lived is not simply about the interplay of, of propositions. Two plus two equals four versus two plus two equals five it is a felt experience with a big emotional charge. Yeah, you know, basically arguing that, you know, Secularists privilege their beliefs and they can't understand how offensive the ridicule of religious belief is to those who believe. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. This is um, this is you look at when you when we talk about freedom of religion versus freedom of worship. Um, you know, I know I know a lot of secularists who just don't understand why Christians are so upset about the um, the. Um, Oh, what's it called? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. The mandate um, with the Obamacare. The um, oh HHS mandate. Um, you know that. Well, so what? These are just 
people that, you know, that want this medication and, you know, we're not requiring churches to dispense it or anything like that. Well, yeah, but you're requiring Christians to dispense it. You're requiring Christians to pay for it, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's like requiring them to pay for, um, to, um, you know, to murder somebody or something, you know, and, and, and like, yeah, they don't get it. It it's just, you know, to them, it, it makes no sense. And, and, and I don't, I don't have a good analogy. Um, because I don't think there's a lot of, I suppose for some, there's a lot of, uh, emotional, uh, tie in with certain, uh, concepts, um, who are seculars, but for the most part, not because the whole point is, is to be, um, that it's, it's very analytical and you sort of, you, you intentionally detach your emotions from it. Um, although, you know, when Kansas started talking about creation in their schools, boy, <laughs> he sure saw some venom then, you know? Um, but then it, 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 it comes across differently because it comes across as contempt. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, that's my best friend you're talking about. That's my brother you're talking about. That's my father you're talking about, you know? Um, and so it, it's different. And, and, you know, for Christians, you know, we're sort of steeped in forgiveness. And so while things can be said that are hurtful to us, you know, for us, we can say, well, you know, I can pray for that person and, um, and, and pray that, that they'll come to the knowledge of the truth and, um, you know, but I'm going to forgive them and, and that helps. But for, um, for religion like Islam, that's not about forgiveness. Um, you know, it it just, it, it hurts that much more because they don't have anywhere to go with with that anger. Yeah. Another thing I thought was really interesting was this, but the last quote that they had on here, would you treat Christian beliefs and Muslim beliefs the same way? Uh, he says, Christians in a majority Christian country may already feel in other ways, isolated, prejudiced against, and they may well regard the attack on their religion as racism by other means. Thompson agreed yeah. with the statement that he wouldn't dream of broadcasting something comparably satirical to Jerry Springer the Opera, which contains some side stripes against Christianity, if it had been the Prophet Muhammad rather than Jesus. Is that so, a double standard? Yes, it is. But at the same time, um, you know, th if you because they are a religious minority and um, and there's some pretty negative feelings against Muslims in our country, especially since 9-11. Um, I can understand where he's coming from. I'm, I can't decide whether I agree with him or not. Um, but I understand where he's coming from. I, I understand where he's coming from, but I think, you know, you and I have talked about how, um, different things have made fun of, of Christianity or like, like, well, you know, why wouldn't they do that again against Muhammad? Because they know they get burned down if they did. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there's always get that. Out. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that's the question. Is he is he making that statement because he doesn't want the New York Times building blown up? You know? <laughs> you know, right. I mean, you know, but that, that uh, it's, was it's a, impossible you know, to know. Not want a bunch of, you know, Muslims rioting, um, you know, like they just happened to on 9-11, uh, you know, in Libya over a movie that nobody ever saw. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, oh, 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 there, there's my political side swipe in there, folks. Uh, you know, but... Uh, I, I, I think that's, you know, an, an interesting issue to ask ourselves. Um, but, uh, anyhow, he asked about, uh, he talked about secularism increase, uh, decrease, you know, not being on the increase really, especially down in, in, in southern countries. Um, uh, well, you know what it is, it's, you know, it's the pop star priests. There you go. Down to Brazil. Down to Brazil. And Father Marcelo Rossi. Or Rossi. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, at the Mother of God Sanctuary. Um, 
<laughs> a Latin Grammy nominated singer who is known for tossing buckets of holy water on worshipers and performing rollicking Christian songs backed by a blasting live band during mass. Yeah, we have a, a, a modern worship service here. Um, but we don't throw water at people. And, um, I don't know that I'd call our band rollicking. Um, but where's your Grammy, man? Yeah. Yeah. We, we lack a Grammy too. <laughs> Cause I don't sing with the band. I turn my microphone off when the band sings. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I, I sing along with the rest of the congregation, but, uh, I, yeah, I turn my mic off cause yeah. Yeah, you probably don't want to hear that. But, um, uh, yeah. Well, Matthew Ward from the second chapter of Acts is doing a concert at my church. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. I remember them from the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Um, Yep, yeah, he's, he's he's doing a concert at my church in December. So, uh, but he's not quite a pop star priest anyway. Anyway, so this yeah. guy he's building this mother water of God sanctuary. The sucker will seat six thousand people, uh, standing room for fourteen thousand more, um, and it's going to have room on the outside for another eighty thousand people, and they can watch the mass on on huge outdoor video screens. <laughs> this guy looks makes um, uh, Joel Osteen. Look pathetic. <laughs> it's interesting in this article. There's no picture of him, but there's just a picture of the, the, all, all these women um, crying outside his um, sanctuary and stuff. Uh, and it looks like almost like a Pentecostal service. I mean, their hands are raised up. They're you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, he's sort of the. Justin Bieber of the Brazilian Catholic Church. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they. Uh, I, I like that. Yeah, you know, there's, you know, uh, 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 nothing stale about his mass. Uh, singing as loud as they could, waving white hankies and swaying with a rocking band. Twenty thousand people jammed at the Mother of God Sanctuary. An estimated thirty thousand people had gathered outside. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I wonder what the, I wonder what the traditional worship guys would would do with this. You know, this is this is Roman Catholicism. This is supposed to be state. And by the Roman Catholics aren't supposed to sing. Really? Oh man, up here in New England, we had a we had a funeral last week. There were over a hundred people there. And I mean, these people, you could tell the Catholics and the Lutherans, man, because the Catholics didn't sing. They, they don't even open the hymnal to, to look at the thing. They just stand there and mumble. But they cross themselves at the right point. <laughs> but, uh, we had another funeral. We had almost 400 people there. Um, and uh, a lot of the people were Catholic. But they, they wouldn't sing. No, Catholics just don't sing. They, they they just you know um, in fact there's an article in, in the Boston Globe that I thought we should sh- me, me, well it was behind the wall so we couldn't do it unfortunately but it was an opinion piece well it said you know the Catholic churches need to give up the organ you know and stuff because of and, and one of the reasons and, and go to more contemporary music and uh, but you know one of the reasons is Catholics up here won't sing hmm. so I had to kind of laugh at at that this um so um. I I, th- I thought it was interesting. He, he said, uh, "says after the inaugural mass on Friday attracted upward of fifty thousand people." Abimi Rossi told reporters they couldn't all fit in. There was a crowd that had stand outside. That's a sign we're on the right path, and it's this sanctuary. Okay, um, now a big sanctuary and they couldn't all fit in. It's a sign that you're on the right path architecturally, maybe. Okay, um, but. Uh, I, I can tell you just from looking at the fact that Joel Osteen's church is the biggest one in the United States, that just because you pack the the place and uh, and you've got a lot of people there doesn't mean you're on the right path. But you're part of the Transforming Churches Network. That means you just want to be like Joel Osteen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, Did you see that article I posted on Facebook? No, I did not. Let's not go down that road. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it sounds like he is taking um, um, it's a, this thing is one of the world's ten biggest churches. Um, but 
it's interesting listening to describing. Described by a Brazilian architect, it has the wide open way out layout, giving it the feel of a warehouse. Concrete walls holding up a sloping blue roof that looks from the outside more like a basketball arena than a house of worship. Um, yeah, and I read this, and I'm going, you know, the one thing that I've always kind of admired about Catholics is you walk in and you know you're in a church. Mm-hmm. You feel like you're in another world. This sounds like it's no, it's more like your typical big auditorium evangelical place there. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, it's it, it would be really interesting to just to to watch uh, one of their services. You know, if if they like stream it or record it or something like that. Oh, um, I know the other thing that got, that caught my attention. He. Uh, uh, the day they opened, he said, um, uh, a day, a day that was dead was transformed because he opened it up on, on Fernandos, which is their version of the Day of the Dead. The priest told worshippers during the service using his gold plated microphone. <laughs> Boy got bling. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a gold plated microphone for your band? No. No, those are a little extra. <laughs> we usually had a, a lot of ours are, are just like karaoke microphones. Because <laughs> ah. that's what we could afford. <laughs> and we've got a few, a couple of nice ones, but then after that, you know, those are wireless and everything. But after that, it was like we ended up realizing we needed a lot of equipment, um, to make sure that we were all covered. And yeah, the, the gold plated ones were a little bit out of our range. Oh, man. Yeah, so I maybe I need to start throwing holy water at people, and that'll help. <laughs> well, you know, it gets me though. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and going, so is this the cult of personality? Uh huh. You know, I mean, you what? Think? What's going to happen to this great big old church that he's building when he's gone? Right. You know, this is my concern about so many of the churches out there, especially these huge multi-site ones. And I, I, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this on a previous show, but I'm not sure if it was one that actually went out. Um, but you know, I, like I'm a fan of Mark Driscoll. Okay. Um, uh, Mars Hill Church. I, I enjoy listening to his sermons. I subscribe to his podcast. I listen to it. Um, him and Joel but, Osteen, huh? Okay. Yeah. Not Joel Osteen. No, I have no use for him, but, um, Mark Driscoll's not afraid to call sin sin. I uh, think you're, I think you're, 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 you're I think he does protest too much, but that's another point. <laughs> but uh, you know, he's they have their Mars Hill churches um, all up and down the East Coast, and um, and he's the preaching pastor at all of them because it's a multi-site church and and they just stream the video and they have other pastors that lead the the rest of the worship service at the various sites but Mark Driscoll he's the one preaching at all of them and um and you know there's there's a lot of other churches that do that same kind of thing and you know I just think what happens when um, you know, when, when he's not preaching there anymore. And, and I did hear him talk about that once and, and he goes, you know, people always ask me, what happens if you get hit by a bus? <laughs> he goes, why is everybody asking what happens when I die? <laughs> Let's just assume I'm actually going to live for a while. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the thing is, it's it's true, you know. What does happen when it's really focused? And I know that with Driscoll as an example, um, he really emphasizes this isn't about me. This is about Jesus, you know. And he really, really pushes that. Um, but at the same time, you compare that with say Willow Creek, which I also enjoy listening to their sermons. All right, and um, and they don't just have Bill Hybels preaching. All right. They've got a number of different people, and and like one of their guys, I can't remember his name. Uh, it's the guy from Australia. Um, he just he used to preach there pretty regularly, and then um, he left and went down to uh, New Mexico or something like that to plant a church. And um, and so you know they regularly have other pastors preaching there, 
um, so that something happens to Bill Hybels or he decides to retire or whatever, people are used to other people fill in the pulpit. It's not a big deal. And right. And it does get to be an issue because, um, you know, somewhere along the line, I mean, even, even I don't know how old more old Mark Driscoll is, um, but eventually, you know, age is going to catch up to him, you know, and, um, you know, he, he needs to start thinking about, um, you know, who will succeed him. Yeah. And because, he talks um, about it. Oh, we've got elders and all this kind of stuff. You know, we've got other people that are trained that could step in and that. But, you know, I... I don't see it. I, you know, he's not, he's not preparing for that. He's not preparing the people for that. You, you got to have people ready for that. And he's just, no. he's not doing it. But anyway, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, when you can get another Grammy, not Grammy nominated pop star priest, you know, they just don't come along that often. No, no, this, although, Hey, you know, the Missouri Synod, we've got that guy from, um, from Megadeth. That's so. true. That's true. We do. All right. So let's go deal with the battle in Episcopalians here. <laughs> so this is like, a, this, these, these people are so much fun. <laughs> um, so um, the uh, Diocese of South Carolina said they are gone. They voted um, to leave the um, Episcopal Church. And our wonderful Catherine Jeffords Shorey uh, has said, you can't leave. You can't make that decision. We have rules that, you know. I mean, it's so funny. To me. I mean, to me, in my mind, when you have to start arguing what the rules are. <laughs> Whether or not you can leave. I love that. Right. You get to listen to this quote. This is beautiful. I assure you, we continue to be the Protestant Episcopal Church of the Diocese of South Carolina. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, when I'm sorry. No, that's not the parishes quote. have left. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, no, when only twelve of the seventy parishes that they want to stay in. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not the quote I was looking for. Um. Yeah, uh, Catherine Jeffersory. The Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina continues to be a constituent part of the Episcopal Church, even if a number of its leaders have departed. Um, but that's not the quote. A number of their for. churches have departed. <laughs> um. Well, this letter that she wrote to them, this pastoral letter. Well, I'll let you find your your little money quote there. I mean, it's so inter- it's, it's interesting to read. Just she she starts it out sounds like it's an epistle from Paul, Catherine, a servant of Christ to the saints of in South Carolina. Grace, <laughs> mercy, and peace of Christ Jesus our Savior be with you all. Yeah, she ripped that you know. off. <laughs> you know, and then after that. You, as the challenges, you are, you and the challenges you face in South Carolina remain in my prayers and those of many, many Episcopalians. As confusion increases, I would like to clarify a number of issues which I understand are being discussed. All right, now it's time to bring in the law here. <laughs> uh, you know, forget the pastoral tone. You know, here's the rules. You can't just up and leave. Uh, you know, uh, you can't, you know, you, you know, uh, you know, you can't be removed without your consent. Um, now, I love this. The talk, one of the big issues is Bishop Mark Lawrence. Um, because uh, the bishop of the, of the South Carolina di- Diocese, they removed him. Uh, the, 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 the Episcopal Church removed him. And it's interesting, in her letter she says, Bishop Lawrence was charged by several members of the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina with having abandoned the communion of the Episcopal Church by making or condoning actions which repudiate the polity, violate the canons or rules of the Episcopal Church. Notice she doesn't say he violated scripture. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's really not an issue. <laughs> so, now, there are approximately 30,000 um, uh, members in the diocese of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina. 
how many of those people brought the charges against him? How many of them were the several? You know, he was charged by several members out of twenty nine thousand. Let's let's guess. Let's go for fifteen thousand. Anybody want to guess fifteen thousand? No, no. Ten thousand? Ten thousand? Be a third of them? No, no, no. Um, five thousand. Five thousand. That'd be that'd be a sixth of them. No, no, no. Twenty five hundred? Thousand? Five hundred? One hundred? Can we go? Fifteen? No. Fourteen? <laughs> Fourteen is the number. Twelve lay people and two priests. Out of 29,000, she gets complaints from uh, 14 people. I'll let you figure out the percentage of this. <laughs> and that's her definition of several. <laughs> that's like a handful of grumpy people in a parish, and that's it. <laughs> yes. So, 12 lay Episcopalians and two priests in South Carolina that brought the charges against Mark Lawrence, Bishop Mark Lawrence. The denomination's 18-member disciplinary board for bishops found him guilty of bounding the Episcopalian Episcopal Church and renouncing its rules in September. So, there are more people making the decision than there were bringing the charges. <laughs> Man, I probably have more people in my congregation that want to get rid of me than that. Right. Now, how many churches are remaining in the province? Of 70. 12. How many lay people made the complaint? 12. I wonder if there's a commonness in this number. Hmm. <laughs> what do you want to bet all those people who made the complaints are part of the 12 that are sticking around? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, I love this. And, uh, I, 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 mean, I mean, just, just some of this stuff is just, her, her letter is just, disagreement about a variety of issues is normal in this church, which has historically been considered a sign of diversity. Since the time of the early church, we've recognized that none of us is fully cognizant to the mind of God. Really? Um, the, the major struggles of the first generation of Christians were over much debated issues of inclusion. Could the uncircumcised be full members? Who could be baptized? So, you know, because of that, we know that it's okay to ordain gay bishops. Um, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, same kind of thing. You know, you know, just because Paul never wrote First Corinthians, because Paul didn't know the full mind of God. Um, please know the Episcopal Church wants you to remain. Oh, yeah, and keep your building and your offerings coming. Keep those cars and letters flowing. People. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you know, th this kind of strikes me that, um, you know, th th this over during the election, you know, there was a little bit, actually not a lot. I was surprised there wasn't more um, about um, immigration. Okay. And and what it comes down to is as, as much of in the United States, as much of a... Um, problems we may be having uh with uh with our economy and you know and, and just all kinds of other things uh that we're struggling with in this country okay um lack of twinkies and um and and so at the same time this is a country where we're having problems that too many people are trying to get in all right nobody's trying to flee from the united states we're not desperately trying to hold on to people here Okay. Um, and so, except maybe Texas, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, and, uh, so meanwhile, you've got these people that are saying, all right, we're out of here. And, and the Episcopal Church is saying, no, 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 you can't leave. We're going to force you to stay. Like, how does that make sense? How does it make sense to force people to stay in a denomination when they disagree with it? You know, you think about in the Missouri Synod with the walkout in the 70s, right? We didn't force those guys to stay. <laughs> we said bye. 
<laughs> Don't let the door hit you on the way out, you know. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's it's just she reading this letter. She never once talks anything about scripture. She never refers to any word of God through the entire thing. She does, however, tell them yeah. clergy in the diocese of South Carolina should be advised they remember members of this church till they renounce their orders or are otherwise removed by Title Seven processes. They also may continue to contribute to the church pension plan until such formal separation. In any case, contributions made while the member was active the Episcopal Church remains vested in the plan, and a pension may be drawn when the plan's rules permit. <laughs> There's our holy, there's our unity. It's in the church pension plan. That's what keeps us together. So she's basically bribing them to stay in. Is it a, well, is it a bribe mean, no, or is it a, blackmail? <laughs> well, no, it's just that I don't know what the rules are, but she, it's that in any case, you know, contribution, the contributions made while the member was active, the Episcopal Church remained vested in the plan and a pension may be drawn. So apparently, you know, if you're vested, you're vested. So, you know, yeah, you, you'll still get that money back. Don't worry about it. I mean, it's just, you know. Uh, it's the Via Medea. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I always have trouble and I mean, I've got a, a good friend who's um, going to uh, uh, divinity school in uh, British Columbia, I think, um, and uh, to be uh, Anglican or uh, Episcopal, I guess, um, a pastor, or I think he's going more toward the seminary professor um, kind of thing. Um, and uh, so, it, you know, we talk a lot and, and I, I try to understand his position and, and he asks a lot about Luther and, and stuff like that. And, um, and, and we talk polity and all kinds of things. And, uh, and I just, I have so much trouble understanding, uh, and, and maybe it's just because of, of my background. Um, but I have trouble understanding a denomination that is not formed based on uniformity of teaching. But that's my bias. See, I, you know, for me, it, the, the whole point of a denomination is that, um, that I can, if I'm on vacation somewhere that I can, if I find another church that sells LCMS on their sign, I can expect that their teachings are going to be pretty much the same as what we teach. And, uh, the you know, service might be different, you know, lots of different variations, but the teachings will be the same. Their approach to scripture is the same. And, um, but there's a lot of denominations out there. That that's not the case. So I don't know. I, I, I struggle with this and it's with, with certain denominations and, um, the Episcopal Church is one of them. Uh, the United Church of Christ is another. Uh, where I'm, I'm just not sure what holds them together. So, the church pension plan. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> it's very obvious. So, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, you know it's, it's kind of a. Yeah, it's kind of fun to read and kind of doing some all kinds of reading, a lot of stuff there. And it's kind of sad, you know, but that's the problem when you have a church denomination where it really, even in the beginning, it was never unity in doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that was never the goal. I mean, you know, Lutheranism was a theological division. Anglicanism was a division, was it was a um, uh, nationalistic division. Um, and that's all it ever was, and there's always been disagreement within that body on theology. But so long as you use the Book of Common Prayer and some other things, you're okay. I mean, it's very interesting that the 39 Articles of Anglicanism uh, says that the uh, God, that the Church is located wherever the gospel is preached, the, the sacraments are administered. 
which they stole directly from the Augsburg Confession. Except Luther and Augsburg Confession says, wherever the uh, gospel is preached purely and the sacraments administered according, rightly, rightly yeah. according to the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very significant difference. Yeah, there's, there's, there's much to be said about what's not being said. <laughs> That's right. So, well, maybe you all feel differently. Uh, maybe you all have comments and questions. You can uh, send them to us at podcast at uh, crossfeednews.com, or you can make comments on our Facebook page, or if you're viewing this on YouTube, you can put comments there, and those will make it to us too. Yep. Yep. So um, I don't know whether so I'll get this out We'll trust Dale to get this done sometime, you know, around Thanksgiving or so, but if nothing else, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> I still have one to do yet, <laughs> even though one of them didn't make it. So, um, so thanks everybody for tuning in. And, uh, you know, even if it's past Thanksgiving, by the time you watch this, uh, we have much to be thankful for. Uh, we have a God who loves us. We have joy and hope and peace. And, um, and as we move into the Advent and Christmas seasons, um, it's just a solid example of, what we have to be thankful for, uh, that God doesn't just love us, but became, he came to live among us. So good night, everybody. God bless.